So um, we have a panel of three uh, folks who are going to be talking about community um, solar, community group net metering uh, solar in New Hampshire and Vermont. And the first is Kate Epson, who is Executive Director of New Hampshire Sustainable Energy Association. You just heard from her, a statewide independent member-based nonprofit that provides education and advocacy to advance clean energy in New Hampshire. Previously, she was an analyst in the New Hampshire Public Utilities Commission. After Kate will be Johanna Miller, is the Energy Program Director at Vermont Natural Resources Council, working to shape clean energy and climate action solutions from grassroots to the legislature. Johanna also serves as coordinator for VCAN, an umbrella group of 100 uh, energy committees that, and partner organizations. Recently, VNRC and VCAN worked with energy committee leaders, statewide officials, and other partners, including Vermont Law School, Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and Surge, to put together a new online community solar toolbox, which is aimed at helping Vermonters move solar solutions forward more swiftly. And Lynn <coughs> Benander, who you met also, is a community entrepreneur and president and CEO of Co-op Power. She's been helping groups to launch businesses for more than 20 years in many different industry sectors. For the last 10 years, she's been focusing on building community-owned energy in her work at Co-op Power. She'll tell you about community solar models that the members of Co-op Power have developed to bring community ownership to this new field. So just a reminder to the presenters, you'll each have uh, 10 minutes max I'll give you a two, one, and time's up uh, if you're getting close. And then we'll take some questions and answers. We are almost back on track, so Kate's going to go first. So, and just for all you three, there's a, uh, an advancer here to the right, advances to the left. Three tracks. Thank you, Bob. Okay, just to get a quick survey, you're all pretty sophisticated in this room, so can you just raise your hand if you have a basic understanding of net metering? Okay, great, so I won't spend any time with that. Um, so in New Hampshire, New Hampshire has a bit of a unique type of group net metering law. It's also known as virtual net metering. Um, it came out of our individual net metering statute where any single entity could net meter any system up to 1,000 kilowatts. And then um, through SB 98 in 2013, we expanded um, those systems to include group um, net meter projects. And what this means essentially is you can have any number of members um, uh, connected with a single host system through a contract. And you could share in the cost and or benefits of, of the production of that system. And you know, there are the boring RSA numbers and the bill numbers if you want to look into that more deeply. Okay, so so a, a basic overview of how it works in New Hampshire, and just to back up for one second as well, um, community solar projects can be done through group net metering in New Hampshire, but they don't all need to be done that way. So group net meter projects are a subset of community solar projects. Um, there are, ver there are various models that you can undertake when doing these kind of projects, and it may not actually be to your advantage to group net meter it, depending on how, who the investors are, who the members are, and what the on-site load is, and various factors like that. And we'll get into that a little bit, but not, not too much, because the other presenters, I think, will go over the models as well. Um, so, so in New Hampshire, if you're gonna go the group net metering route, you need to be customers all of the same distribution utility and you have to be taking their default energy service. So that basically means you haven't signed up with some sort of competitive supplier like ENH or North American Power. Um, you're just taking that default energy straight from your distribution utility. Um, and there's no limitation on group members and you don't have to be contiguous. So, you know, you could all be PSNH now, Eversource customers from all over the state, but you just all have to be taking their default energy supply. Um, there are a lot of different models you can use with group net metering in New Hampshire. 
Um, I think there are several of you here that have already undertaken some of those. Raise your hand if you're in New Hampshire and you've either already done one or you're in the midst of doing one of these types of projects. So look around and see who they are. Um, they're going to be your really your true experts on this because they've slogged through the nuts and bolts over, I'm imagining, many months if not years. Um, you can structure an LLC, um, meaning you can have different investors and then the tax benefits will flow to the individuals. So you can capture that tax equity. Um, you can have a co-op. Um, you can have a third party developer where you just um, enter as a member to offer up your electrical load essentially for, for some, sort of, um, some sort of benefit, however you decide as a group. Um, and then you can also do it just as an individual and you may have multiple meters on a property or as a town with multiple meters in your municipality. Um, Here's how it really gets different in New Hampshire. You don't get to share the credits of that production across the group members. You get a check uh, that's cut to the host, the group host, once per month from the distribution utility. And I'm gonna get a little bit more into how that works in a future slide. So that can make a, a big difference in the project. The, the margins on these kind of projects are fairly slim in New Hampshire. We don't have very lucrative incentives in other ways through SREX. Um, we do have rebate programs. Um, so you, you really need to capture all of those possible incentives and the tax equity um, and figure out what, what's the business model that's gonna make the project finances work. Um, but there's been, a, there's been a lot of frustration in going through the rulemaking process in New Hampshire, so I want all of you to know that this is really the first go round. You know, the utilities have obviously, they've fought these type of expanding policies very, very strongly. And so the laws can change. For example, you know, we had a bill that was trying to expand the cap on net metering in New Hampshire and to bring back that bill credit sharing opportunity. And it wasn't successful this time, but it doesn't mean it can't be successful in the future. So, so we, can, we can keep improving this law. Um, okay, so going back to the credits, the the payment for these systems is going to going to go to a group the group host. So that's essentially where you build the solar system and the meter in which that interconnects with. That's going to be your group host, and then you have the members, and you are essentially going to get your credits based on the system size. And if it's a, if it's a medium to small system, 100 kW or smaller you're going to get full retail. That's all KWH-based charges. And you'll get that as um, a check, the value of what that is once per month. And then that has to be distributed as defined in the contract fr from the host to the members. Now, if the system is larger um, than 100, up to one megawatt or up to 1,000 kilowatts, then you're really only going to get the value of the default energy supply charge. So you, 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 the project economics start to decrease as you get larger here. Um, you know, as most of you probably know, the rates went up dramatically in New Hampshire this winter. I think some of the rates for Liberty went up to as high as 15 cents for the energy supply charge. Um, but then in the summer, it generally drop, drops to around seven or eight. So, so it will vary also based on kind of what the market is, is bearing and, and then what the PUC approves for rates. Um, so keep that in mind as well. And, um, and then there's this transfer payment. And another very important consideration here is that this could be taxable income. Since it's not as a bill credit share, um, you have to look at is if that income coming into the host and then being distributed to members is considered taxable. Not in New Hampshire, we don't have an income tax, but federal taxable. <laughs> um, and then there's a true up because um, the way you have to structure these projects is the, the historical load of all the members and the host have to roughly match the annual production of the system. So if, you, if that, if that um, production is much more than that annual historic load, there's going to be a true up and you may actually have to pay some of that back to the utility. Um, and if not, then you don't. <laughs> so be careful about how you size these systems. <laughs> okay, so getting to the agreement, a, a lot really, a, a lot rests on how this agreement is going to work between the hosts and the members, and um, it depends on how you structure the members 
and then um, what the legal needs are and the revenue needs are of the members. Um, there, there's a structure that's being deployed right now in New Hampshire that essentially is a third party developer taking on members um, as their load and then the members don't have to put anything up front. They don't make an upfront investment, but they get a discount um, on some percentage order or some you know, cent per kilowatt hour discount um, in the form of a check in, over some period over the course of the year. So, so you just have to, um, that has to be very explicitly written out in these member and host agreements because disputes could very quickly arise legally if um, a party is feeling that they were not getting what they signed up for. So I would advise um, to have these contracts re reviewed by a, by a professional. Um, this is as boring as a TPS report, but I put the links in here so you can easily find them. You have an application and an annual report that you need to fill out. They're linked to the Public Utilities Commission website. I won't spend any time on it. That's where you get it. Um, I think I, I've kind of gone over some of these. It, it's really important to consider the size based on what your reimbursement rate is. It's really important to consider the membership load versus the production amount of the system. Um, and it's really important to understand how members can come and go from this group so you can keep that production matched well with the load and you don't get penalized at the, at the end of the true up period. Um, and then also these the nexus of considerations of the shared costs versus the shared benefits of the group are essential. I won't get into the technical aspects. Um, that's basically governed by interconnection rules in New Hampshire, um, also on the Public Utilities website. So um, happy to take any questions. I think we're saving them till the end, but thank you very much. And, and one last um, note, we it's, it's, um, it's similar to what you've heard referenced that's in Vermont. We have developed NHSEA, a group net metering um, guide and community energy guide. It has um, member templates, it has PPA templates, and it has a lot of the different model considerations in it. It's, it's quite long. Um, email me if you're interested in um, having it, and I can send you over the PDF. Thanks. Although I thank Kate for the technical um, overview of group net metering. While Vermont's net metering law is different, there's also a lot of um, similarities to it and some of the good advice uh, that she offered you I, um, in terms of considerations are relevant in this as well. Okay. Okay. So we have been working, as I noted before when I gave an overview of VCAN, um, one of the things that we work to do is try and put together some technical resources. So when a lot of communities that we were working with started to become interested in um, solar, and as you heard before, nearly 70% of Vermonters can't go solar for one reason or another, we wanted to put together some guide and technical resources to help them understand what are the options out there and front load the process so if they wanted to explore different kinds of models, we could offer up a set of sort of templates and resources and model contracts that they could turn to. Um, so our definition of community solar for the online solar toolbox that I will showcase to you is a solution for schools, municipalities, institutions, or anyone who can't go solar on their own property. Um, again, said about 70% of Vermonters. And I just want to underscore here as I showcase some of the things um, that, as you heard a little bit about earlier, not all solar in Vermont especially is created equal because of the issue regarding RECs. So, you know, as you're considering these uh, projects, you know, if you want to actually own the renewable attributes of that project, it does weigh into the financial piece of it, um, but it's really important to think about um, in terms of exploring your solar solution. So, but what I really want to sort of underscore here for you tonight 
is that solar is a good investment. Um, there are lots of options and no better time. Um, as I noted earlier, as you probably are well aware, the federal 30% investment tax credit um, will be set to expire in the end of 2016, likely to go away all together for residential systems. Um, so time to go solar. And in Vermont in particular, we do have the leadership in particular of innovative utilities. Um, Green Mountain Power, our largest utility, actually led the charge and, and was um, enacted and helped enact a statute that requires Vermont um, utilities to pay people more for their solar, up to 20 cents a kilowatt hour for smaller projects and 19 cents for a larger community project. So that is a significant incentive, but because of the success of our net metering program, the Public Service Board right now is undergoing a process to explore what that program looks like, how it balances a variety of different goals, including ratepayer impacts. So that solar incentive is also likely to significantly change or go away. So if nothing else, Vermonters, I would leave you with go solar soon. Um, um, <clears throat> not that going solar in general is not a good investment, but we have much to do. Um, I'm gonna quickly breeze through um, three primary overarching models. It's hard to sort of put the different <coughs> solutions out there into a tidy package. Um, so, but I will highlight a third party ownership model, uh, util utility ownership or sponsored model, and a direct community ownership model. So starting first, eh? with a third party ownership model. Um, this is a sort of, as I have described it a little bit, it's more sort of off the shelf, easy, um, partner with a you know, third party entity, a developer, many of the developers in this room, sort of offering communities or interested citizens a quote unquote turnkey package. They often bundle the financial incentives for you. Um, again, you wanna be cognizant of what they do with the RECs, if that is a concern for you. Um, but they often build, maintain, and ensure, ensure the array, and then often offer system performance guarantees, things like that. Um, some offer no upfront cost. That's also potentially an interest for some. And often there's little risk, like schools and municipalities often like to partner with a third party entity because there's not a lot of risk in that. Um, often opts out and and many of them, you know, savings increase when utility rates rise. So here's just an example. This is clearly not uh, comprehensive of a few of the third party installers in the state of Vermont. We're lucky to have many. These, these folks offer a variety of different approaches. Each one is a little bit different. We have many case studies on our evolving um, website. So if you have solar success stories, we'd like to hear about them. Um, and just gonna note really quickly for full transparency, my husband is a Springfield, Vermont boy who did begin working for Sun Common when they first started. I don't really care if you go <laughs> solar with Sun Common, sorry guys, um, but I just want you to go solar. So for full transparency, he came back to Vermont with a good clean energy job. Um, <clears throat> another model is a utility um, owned and sponsored model. I'm highlighting two here. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but this is another approach. Um, for example, Vermont Electric Cooperative and um, the northwest part of Vermont is putting together a five megawatt array. Um, they want to help drive down the cost for those projects. They want to better manage the siting. They're sort of taking the lead there and Green Mountain Power has put together another sort of project driven by the utility in Rutland and they're doing others. So that's the third type of model. I want to spend a little bit more time here on the direct community ownership model. We have lots of success stories to tell here in the state of Vermont. I'm gonna highlight two really quickly. 10 minutes is really hard. Um, the first <clears throat> is the 10 Stones Community Solar Collective. It's a 24 kilowatt community solar array that was a partnership of five households on a shared, jointly shared piece of land. And they essentially created a small LLC. They have a member operating agreement. You can see that they shared it with me here. This is their beautiful solar array. They're working with their utility and the utility helps them manage the billing of that project. It's a great example. Um, this next example is a really powerful and um, fabulous success story, the Boardman Hill Solar Farm. Many of you may have had the privilege of meeting um, Roland Marks or Marcy Tanger. Um, they work closely with the Vermont Law School and this project is a 150 watt, kilowatt community owned array um, that is comprised of over 25 individuals and a few businesses. 
It's again a self-managed, non-profit, limited liability com company. They manage themselves. They outreach to their neighbors. They have no third party partner except an installer um, that they've worked with, again, to help drive down the costs of the project. Um, they are committed to, and they were committed to, and Roland himself tells this story most powerfully about the fact that they really wanted to own the environmental attributes of that project. So they were able to um, put a project together for a very um, impressively low price of $2.87 and installed what? Um, then they get to take the individuals got to take the 30% investment tax credit off the top of that. Um, there's far more to say about this project. We have a really long case study on our website. And what's really important about this project is it's a, and about many of these, but this one in particular, um, we worked with the Vermont Law School to put together a compendium of, of documents that, that for anyone who's interested in this kind of approach um, might use as a place to start um, putting together a project of this, um, which includes a model group net metering agreement um, and a member uh, operating agreement and a model land lease agreement. Um, that is all on our website. And then, this is really important too, as I noted before, Bob said in my long introduction, sorry, um, been working with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, the Public Service Department, um, the um, School Boards Association, um, to put together a model contract template for school and municipal projects in particular. Um, and so the goal is to just put together, as you know probably, oh gosh, that um, schools and municipalities have a little bit more of a risk aversion. This model top template contract is meant to sort of avert um, some of their concerns and address them. It was vetted through lots of, and written by several attorneys and it's crafted to put the advantage or a fair advantage to um, municipal and school solar projects. So it's a great resource. Um, and this is just a snapshot of the online community solar toolbox that we mentioned. Again, many thanks to Ben um, Civiletti for helping me put this together and to all of you who shared your stories and who offered advice. Um, I wanted to just showcase this is where you know we are working to put together to highlight some of these different models and approaches. So as I'm fast forwarding through this conversation right now, you can dive a little deeper to look at some of these different kinds of approaches that might interest you. Um, I wanted to highlight in particular because in the state of Vermont right now, I'm not sure if it's happening um, in New Hampshire, there is a lot of conversation <coughs> and some controversy over how solar is being cited and it's really you know, has the potential to really undermine our ability to deploy solar quickly. And we, I think, especially energy committee leaders, uh, folks who are unbiased but still really want to see good solar projects move forward, have a, an important role to play in helping to foster a civic dialogue. And I think Woodstock, I commend you for helping to, to do that in your community. Um, I'm gonna just, Sort of assessing the solar solutions. This I'm going to give this website. <laughs> this is, there's lots to consider. Here's just a few things. You'll see more on our um, web page. How to get started. Uh, we note again here. Here are some things to consider and some resources to turn to as you begin to explore. And before Bob cuts me off, I just want to note a quick legislative update on these issues for for some of you all. As you probably know, um, Vermont's moving to address its flawed speed program, which will hopefully address many of the issues regarding the REC um, problem, I would say. Um, so stay tuned to that. It will need public support and public vigilance to ensure that it actually moves forward. It passed out of the House overwhelmingly, went through the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee, and um, but it's on shaky legs right now, which is really important. To, Fortunate. Um, and then lastly, um, because I know many of you came to this forum and worked tirelessly every day on weatherization and solar and everything else, there is an effort afoot in the state of Vermont to put a price on carbon pollution. Um, my organization is actively involved in that. We've done an independent economic analysis that shows that such a policy could do three things, significantly reduce Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions, grow jobs in the economy, and do so in a way that mitigates the impact of low-income Vermonters. So I just also invite you, as we work at the local level, to think about other bigger issues. We have some information about that campaign right over there. And I would love to be a resource to you. And again, your thoughts on what is useful to you for this online community solar toolbox are welcome at any time. Thank you.
follow. <laughs> Got some great resources here. I'm just going to invite you to all just raise your hands up a little bit. High, stretch, look up in the sky, look down at the floor. You've been listening for a long, long time to some great, great things. Um, what I want to do is just share with you some of the questions that our members ask at Co-op Power when our community energy co-ops are thinking about doing community solar to invite you to think about whether these questions would be of use to you. And um, the first question we ask is, how much solar is enough? So right now the wisdom is that every home needs about five kilowatts of solar. And about 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, our members started putting solar up, and they put up one kilowatt, or one and a half kilowatts. And some of them, 30 years later, are still living, running their whole home. I have a friend who's running their home and their farm on one and a half kilowatts of solar. And they think it's adequate and fantastic. And they've just designed their whole way of life around that. So how much is enough? Do we all need is five kilowatts? Or could we really think again about the energy efficiency work and really scale back our energy use so that we're all using one kilowatt? Kilowatt, we need to use up a whole lot less land you know, to be putting up these solar arrays. So that's the first question we really ponder, is can we, can we cut back? on the electric use that we're, that we're trying to size our systems for. And so if we put up a 600 kilowatt array and we're serving 600 families each with a kilowatt, that's a very different impact than if each family's gonna need five kilowatts. The next question we look at is price per panel. I mean price per kilowatt. I just said it wrong. We don't want to, we don't care about price per panel because panels produce different amounts of solar. So if someone's selling you something that's a price per panel, you want to know, well, how much energy is that? How much energy is that going to be producing? And so if you can, if you get two offers of this dollar per kilowatt, I mean this dollar per panel, you have to ask, how many kilowatts is that? And um, you know, so that you can be comparing apples to apples because price per panel doesn't tell you too much. The next question we ask is, who owns it? And um, how many of you are members of a food co-op? How, how many, uh, and so you, you understand why who owns it matters, right? Because cooperatives are a way that groups of people can own things together. And there's a lot of ways that we can own it. We can own it ourselves, we can own it with other people. Um, but. Um, it's, I think it's really important, the members of Co-op Power feel like it's really important that who owns our energy resources, it really matters. And if they're all being owned by companies that are really far away, that's just a choice you want to make. And if local ownership is important to you, it's very important that you really find out who owns it. And if you want the simplicity and ease of not owning it, then by all means, you know, go ahead. But I think our concern has been that sometimes the marketing of the various um, businesses that are selling community solar, a lot of our members have signed up for community solar and thought it was locally owned and then found out later they had a tiny interest in an LLC that gave them no voting power, no say, nothing, none of the attributes of local ownership. And so I think it's important that if local ownership is important to you, that you find out if this is indeed locally owned. And, and how would you know? What does locally owned mean? How could you tell? What would you ask? No, no, not that. A little participation from the audience. I just want to see if you're awake a little bit. Where is it based? Where is it based? Okay, where is the home office based? What else could you ask? That's right. Who owns the SREX? Where is that income going to go, right? So one of the attributes of ownership is if there's a profit, you get it. You get to share in it, right? So where do the profits go? Where does the income go? Yep. Yeah, what's the financial structure? Where's the money going to come from? How does it get spent? Other things? So the attributes of ownership are that you control it, right? So is there a meeting you're going to go to and vote for something? 
if you if there isn't, then you don't own it, and maybe you don't want to go to meetings. You've been to enough of them. I have a lot every every night of the week usually, but um, so it's not that we always want to have everything locally owned. But if you want it, just for full disclosure, and if the people in your community are looking for local ownership, you want to own it. You want to control it. So you'll be part of decision making and you want the benefits to go to you. So if there's SREC income, it comes to you. If there's other kind of income, you're going to share in it. So these are just questions to ask. And again, my major, as a consumer advocate, my major concern is that people know what they're signing. They really know what they're getting into. I think that's important. Um, let's see. And well, another issue is the group net metering, all the policies. And you've got some fantastic groups with BCAN and New Hampshire Solar Energy Association advocating for you. But if you don't get up and participate, you will not have the policies that you need to really make these work well. And I don't think we're quite there yet. We're getting there. Vermont's a lot closer than New Hampshire, but oh my lord, help Kate in New Hampshire if you can. You know, really, really show up when you need to because those the laws in New Hampshire are really not supportive of the kind of uh, community solar that we all want to see uh, made available to everyone. So every one of us is going to have to be participating a lot in the public policy because utilities have a lot of concerns about community solar and they're putting caps on, on what we can put together and then uh, all kinds of constraints on the virtual or group net metering and we need to make sure those policies are the right ones. Um, basically when our groups get together they figure out well what are our goals? Who do we want to serve? Are, they for are we interested in community solar for town buildings? for our homes, for local businesses, for community organizations? Who, who do we want to have benefit? Um, what do we want to spend? And if we're, the, the prices range from $1.80 a watt to more than $5 a watt. And that's a pretty big range. And I'm going to guess that of all the community solar options you have in front of you, you might not know what that end cost is going to be because it's hard to find out and i'm pretty educated and i go on websites and it takes me a long time to kind of figure out it's like what is this offer really going to be and what i've noticed is that um that most of the for-profit um, offerings are somewhere in the 350 to four dollar a watt range um, a lot of the individual community structured ones are in the same range but for different reasons because there's profit that goes in for the for-profit ones. People are making money on those. Um, if you develop it in your own community, often it takes a lot of work and it's a one-off deal so it's hard to get going. Um, and then if you have a group of projects, although I, the Barstow, that last one that um, Johanna presented, got down to $1.80 a watt, I think with the 30% off the 280. So, um, but that's the range and you want to just really be able to compare apples to apples um, and find out exactly what that price is per kilowatt or price per watt. Um, you want to decide whether you want to serve low income people and there's, or renters and there's a variety of ways to do that if you have a justice agenda. Um, our members really want to really care about where these are getting built and they don't want them built on prime farmland. Checking my time here. Okay, good. Um, and a lot of people want no upfront costs. And so you're gonna pay a little bit for that right to have no upfront costs and no hassle. Um, but there's really some great opportunities there too. Um, let's see. So I think those are, those are the important ones. And we just really want communities to understand that you have a lot of options about how to put these together and how to compare them and set them up side by side. And a lot of you in your communities might have an agricultural committee working in your town. And you also have food co-ops that are serving your town. And you've also got for-profit um, food producers and you've got nonprofit food producers and there's a whole uh, food economy that's really helping you get local food where you live. And I'd like to offer you the model that we need the same kind of energy 
economy. I'm, my ten minutes is up, and um, so that you that you might want to be looking at ways that you can build your energy co-op alongside your energy committee, alongside the nonprofits and for profits that are helping you build your um, build the, your local energy economy. So, let me know if you'd like more assistance with that. Take care. just open the floor to you all now, take questions, and um, if there's a specific person you want to direct it to, do so, otherwise we'll just float the thing along. John. Uh, this is for Kate. You said that, uh, you talked about group net metering being a subset of this broader category, community solar, uh, and it maybe especially in the New Hampshire scene where the group net metering is somewhat awkward. Um, what what else is under that umbrella of community solar? Because I have I have never heard of it described as anything other than basically synonymous. I I guess here's the difference that I was thinking of. I don't know if there are other subsets, but you could um, have a group of investors form an LLC, put a system on a building with a very large load, um, so it serves say 10% of that load no energy would ever back feed out, so there'd be no need to net meter. And you'd capture basically the highest value of the avoided cost of energy that they would pay on their utility bill, and you'd set up a PPA between that system and then the, the host site. And so you'd, you'd obviate any need to group net meter. So that's essentially what I was getting at. We helped put a four kilowatt um, installation on the group house in a in a uh, community with four different families. So they put up a four kilowatt array on the group house, and then submetered to the four houses in that community. And the utility only had one master meter at the beginning of the community, and so there wasn't any net metering. It just um, each of those houses just fed off of that one main meter. So I would say to a certain extent that our, or our organization um, plays that role. The solar community, I would urge, could get much better organized, and we try to act as that coordinating entity. Um, we actually, we're C3, so we're limited um, the amount of lobbying we can do, but we, we actually do have a lobbyist right now um, to protect our renewable portfolio standard and our renewable energy fund. So, um, there's that, but then there there's the net metering policies, and there are other policies at play. So, so we're happy to continue to expand that service to the extent that we are legally allowed. Me. So my question is for Johanna, and it is very tangential and arguably completely off topic. But I think it's <laughs> but it's important because we haven't had any lip service to the single most important thing happening in Vermont right now, which is putting a price on carbon pollution. Boom! Can you give us your thirty, your sixty seconds, or however many I minutes did, you want? I did to take one little brief moment of it, but um, I did. Thank you for that teeing it up. Um, <laughs> Um, there is a growing coalition called Energy Independent Vermont. As I noted, they did commission an independent environment or economic analysis of could Vermont go it alone, knowing that the United States Congress is likely to take little or no action, and also knowing that it's very unlikely that our friends in New Hampshire and in the region would join in a regional solidarity like the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative does for electricity anytime soon, unfortunately. Although I'd love to work with you if that is not the case. Um, and that, that um, effort has gotten some hearings in the legislature this year it is going to be a long process. I was just in Brattleboro last night with some leaders of the Brattleboro Energy Committee and others um, talking about what this policy could look like. Um, the goal is to 
I keep saying, let's have a fair, fact-based conversation that is not based on fear, which is already what the fuel dealers have been putting out there, um, just even through the initial conversations, but we are lucky enough to have um, lawmakers that are open to exploring this, including the Speaker in, of the House who is working with us um, and other leaders in House Natural Resources and House Ways and Means to look at a joint um, energy committee and some hearings this summer on it. But just as I would suggest Kate would benefit from, and the efforts to push solar in um, lovely New Hampshire would benefit from the voices of just citizens supporting good policies that help people reduce their greenhouse gas emission and fossil fuel consumption. Um, so I'd urge you to get involved as individuals or energy committee leaders in whatever way you are able. Um, and I would also urge you to do that in the same way um, in terms of learning about the carbon pollution tax effort and just suggesting that we should have a fair and robust conversation, knowing that this is likely an inevitable policy. Let's do it well, let's do it right. We can craft a policy right. Thank you, Alan. Oh, and also just tangentially, I've just learned that Bernie Sanders is going to run for president. He's going to announce it on Thursday. So Alan, you asked that question or you moved really for it early. Is it right? Really? Didn't you really announce? So. It appears. <laughs> APR just tweeted it. Oh, could you I wasn't kidding. Sanders, 2016. Well, I'll start, and others can infill, but. The, I mean the, so essentially, when you're talking about solar power or renewable energy, you have the energy attribute, um, and then you also have the, it's, it's clean energy, and so the renewable attribute all in one is good, clean solar power. And when you unbundle those attributes, and you, you can unbundle those attributes in Vermont, you know, that's what a RUC market is, you ascribe a financial value to those attributes, and you trade those attributes in the New England market, um, then they have a financial value. Um, in the state of Vermont, we have a flawed policy that we're working to fix, which has allowed um, utilities or developers to um, develop solar pro or develop projects like the Lowell Wind Project um, in the Northeast Kingdom, developed by Green Mountain Power, and they sold the wrecks into the New England market, but they're claiming it's renewable and it's meeting Vermont's clean energy goals, um, but it's, you know, it's not renewable if you sell the attributes. And I don't know. So the, the principle is the same in New Hampshire. We have um, a solar carve out in our renewable portfolio standard. So you can create a solar rec um, in the Nepole GIS system, um, but when you create it and then sell it and it gets retired by the buying entity, then um, it's, it's put into the mix to comply with that renewable portfolio standard. So it's not yours anymore. It's in the retail electric, electric sales mix. Um, what happens in New Hampshire is that four years ago, the legislature decided to cut the value of the price of the RECs for solar RECs. And so they're the lowest value um, in New England. And so what a lot of people do when they create RECs in New Hampshire, they sell them into the Massachusetts class one rec market to maximize the revenue stream that they can get. So then not only are they retired, that they were never even New Hampshire recs. So I just wanted to clarify, so recs, there are two values for solar power. There's the energy that's produced and the renewable energy credits, which are the environmental attributes of that power. <clears throat> you can keep both of them or you can split them up and sell. If you're doing a project, you can sell the recs if you do that, it might be a slight more advan uh, in monetary advantage to you, but you cannot legally call that project uh, a solar renewable energy project that you now are taking power from. You no longer own the right to call it that. Kevin? I would just, I would just like to add a point, because having, having worked at this, on this issue a lot at Vermont Law School, and um, it, it's not just about money, and it's 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 not just about about selling something to get money to finance more solar. As Bill Bender said, when you take a power contract or anything and you strip the recs off it and you sell them to someone in another state, what you're really doing is exporting the rule of power 
and you're importing 60% fossil fuel and 40% nuclear. So when you do that, you're not, you're not reducing your, your community's carbon footprint, you're actually growing your community's carbon footprint. And this is what Vermont has done with its renewable energy programs. We're really over the last 10 years, the more that we've done our speed and our other programs, the higher Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions have been. So it's about, it, it, I mean, selling your recs is really about doing the wrong thing for the planet. <laughs> Just in the sake of, we've only got about 10 minutes more, I'd, I'd like not, I'd like to get off of Rex, okay? And this could go on all night long, so I don't want to go there anymore. Uh, I'd like uh, all of you, if you can, uh, discuss an alternative site for solar energy to the farm fields that we are used to in our developing most commonly. And that is the use of uh, carports, parking lots, uh, where we've already paid paradise but of a parking lot. Uh, and that's wide open space. It's already been cleared of trees, so the site lines are, uh, the solar lines are very good. The rooftops of the buildings adjacent to those, those are targeted in other parts of the country. I haven't heard any discussion of it here, and I think it's a much more worthy site for our development. So do you have any examples to extending into your co-op group or possible efforts in that direction in, in this area of the country? Well, I'll just say quickly, I think the carport issues, we just have fewer in the Northeast um, as opposed to the Southwest. So if you build the carport to put the solar on it, it will add to your cost. Um, but we have, you know, we have tremendous amount of warehouse roof space, all this, you know, the strip mall and kind of that commercial rooftop space. A lot of that's very good. Um, there's a lot of capped landfill space and other brownfield space that can be utilized as well. And I would just say, um, we advocated really heavily last year in the net metering uh, law to, to increase the amount of solar that can be developed on the landfill, for example, because Vermont's 500 mega kilowatt cap was not going to make it financially viable to develop on those under unattractive spaces. And so there are some constraints to developing in places like quarries and brownfields and landfills. And because it's a little bit more expensive because on a landfill project, you have to ballast the system. You can't penetrate down into the... So there are some serious issues I've heard. Like on, on We have a lot of... A few locations in the state of Vermont, only thankfully, that have big box stores. So people are always like, put it on big box stores. But again, you have to ballast the system. You can't max out the roof because they weren't meant to have a tremendous amount of concrete. So that also means you can't get maximum sun exposure because because of wind issues. So there are serious issues and what it means for developers or you know, is that sometimes it drives up the cost of projects. So if we want it in the state of Vermont's conversation right now about incentivizing projects in those kinds of locations, but we need to incentivize them because they come with an extra cost. If we want to take the pressure off of our precious farm fields in places that are we want to keep undeveloped, then we need to figure out ways to incentivize the best places, but that comes with a cost. And our, our members have voted to only build continues solar on marginal land. And so we've done a lot of roof studies and found they were inadequate. You know, so it, 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 we are spending more money to do that. By how much? What's, what's more? In, you know, the grand, in the grand scheme of things, as a percentage more versus uh, standard? I don't know, I'm gonna ask Craig that. More is a penny, more is a dollar, more is $10. You know. we, we worked with um, Solar Source to put up, is Craig still here? We work with Solar Source to put up the array at the Brattleboro Food Co-op. Um, what's your experience? I mean, we had to do the roof studies there, and it was adequate for the ballasted <coughs> system we put up. That, that's a non-ballasted system. Oh, okay. So that, I mean, that was uh, a system that uh, is roof integrated. That, um, was made out of uh, basically you know, ISO foam that's wrapped in the same material. TPO membrane that was welded to the, the real structure. So um, that, that was very light. But do you have a sense of how much more it costs to do that research on whether the roofs are it, over versus just I mean, there's a lot of, going there's on virgin land? There's a lot of roofs even around the Keene area. Um, pre engineered buildings, Butler buildings, they were designed just for the current snow load. A lot of them were from the 70s and 80s. So, it, I mean, you've, you've got to invest probably uh, 50 cents uh, a watt additional um, to do the install, again, for the structural upgrades. Again, that's kind of a, a swag number. 
One thought that I have is if you plan, if you if you know somebody that's planning a new building, if they plan it into it initially, it's going to be a lot less added expense. So you try to think about these things ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you're looking at um, uh, tax credits that are available to you when you implement a project, um, do any of those can you can you use credit? tax credits to offset the cost of the entire system in terms of like if you add a structural framework to do this. There's a 30% the tax credit that homeowners have or that business have. Does that count as a, as a cost that you can offset or is, or is it only the cost of the system itself? I, I believe that we've added that into the bait, to the core. So cutting trees down to make oh. solar access, is that not no. work? No? No, the tree work wasn't included. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not an accountant. Yeah. Uh, if you're an accountant, but the Department of Energy website, their page on the tax credit says site prep work for the solar project is <coughs> applicable to your, you know, you can apply that to the credit. That's the one. Just the thing. So, so that, that was something in the Solarize program really wasn't um, thought far enough to, to let people know about that. So if the trees, if tree removal could be added to it, you know, into your tax credit that you're capable of getting for your solarized project, you know, that would take, in my case, um, ten thousand dollars worth of trees, I get three thousand bucks back off it. That would make a, that would have probably made me think a lot more about joining in. So I understand <laughs> <laughs> But uh, anyway, just wanted to throw that out there. We got time for a couple more. Any other questions out there? I have a comment. I, uh, on the carbon tax, I attended a number of those meetings a few weeks ago in Montpelier, and uh, we're not breaking new ground. I ask all of you to go to Google or your browser and put in British Columbia carbon tax, and you'll find four or five really good articles it is a financial success. It's win, win, win for anybody unless you're driving a gas customer. So really look into it. Any other questions? Um, any other questions for all the community panels? Um, I just want to ask if we all succeed, as we want to, when will the utilities like claim no way we Distributed solar. Like, is it going to take us 20 years to get to that point? Or if we have big. Oh, okay. So, okay. so they, they already claim that. Um, they, they claim that there's a cross subsidy that occurs where everyone that um, puts in solar or offsets load then exports costs to maintain the distribution system to all the non participating customers of that same system. So that argument holds a lot of weight, especially when legislators hear that. Um, it, it often doesn't, but it's beholden on different areas to conduct value of solar type of studies to really get at that data. And I know, um, I believe Vermont has done one, and New Hampshire has not yet. Vermont did a study, the Public Service Department did, and it showed that net metering is not impacting rate bearers yet. Um, but as I said, their Public Service Board is convening a forum to explore what does net metering look like post-2017. Vermont's net metering world is going to look like it does right now with the solar incentive structure and the ability for um, Vermonters not in Washington Electric or some of the cooperative territories to zero out their bill. That landscape is going to look far different. Another reason to go solar soon in Vermont, especially in Green Mountain Power Territory. Um, is it but locked in if you do it? Before? It's locked in. Your grandfathered in for 10 years for the solar adder and that sort of thing. Um, but I would say the balance in terms of the value, you know, the impact to customers who are net metering is shifting a little bit because our load structure is shifting and more people are doing it. Some people have zeroed out their bills. I mean, so the conversation that is happening right now on the Public Service Board is really important for folks to participate in because we want to re maintain a strong net metering system in the state of Vermont that enables everyone to go solar, but in an affordable way that is fair to everyone. I was at a meeting with National Grid in um, Western Massachusetts, and there were about 100 community advocates for solar in the room and solar installers. 
and the rep from National Grid said it's costing us $800 million to maintain the grid, and half of that is the cost of solar. And we all just, our jaws dropped, and we looked, and we're just like, no way. <laughs> but that's what's happening in Massachusetts. One last estimate in terms of the value of solar in the state of Vermont, I think the estimate is that distributed generation over the course of time has, uh, has obviated the need to invest in transmission and distribution up to the value of about $400 million, I believe. So that is a benefit to all Vermont repairs. And the Acadia Center, if you Google it, just issued a, a study in Massachusetts saying that actually solar is adding value to the grid. Okay, so I think we've, we've reached 8 o'clock. So I'm going to, the panelists will still be around for a few minutes, yes? So feel free to ask them individual questions. Um, I want to remind you, we have...